we want to explore the concept of mindfulness. Let's remember that mindfulness is one of the processes that make up um, the skill of psychological flexibility. With mindfulness, again, we have the situation that it's another concept that is increasingly being used in our culture and in education. Most of us have heard of this term, but what exactly do we mean by it? Think about how you would define mindfulness and what you associate with it or what you think characterizes it. Um, in this video, psychologist Russ Harris explores five common myths about mindfulness. It's the idea that some people might have that it's basically about meditation, that it has to do exclusively with religion or spirituality, that it's all about relaxing, about having positive thoughts, or about having good emotions, about feeling good. But the idea is that these are actually kind of misconceptions that can also be unhelpful and keep people from either not practicing mindfulness regularly or doing it in a way that has actually negative effects. So think about how the myths related to your previous understanding of mindfulness, if you would have thought similarly, uh, similar thoughts about the term, and how would you describe the concept of mindfulness after watching the video or after finding out about these common myths? <clears throat> Here's another way that we can approach our understanding of mindfulness. Here are three pictures, A, B, C. First, stop the video and look at the pictures and describe what is going on in these scenes and how they are different from each other, and then decide which of the images you think best demonstrates mindfulness and why you think so. So in the first image here, we see a woman walking in a landscape and having a lot of things in her mind, thinking a lot of different thoughts. In the second image, we see the same woman also walking through a landscape and Seemingly in her mind, she observes, she notices, sees this landscape with her senses. And in a third image, we again see a woman walking through the landscape. And in her mind, she actually sees herself walking through the landscape. She is aware that she is also having a lot of thoughts in her mind. Now, I think many of us agree that actually mindfulness is not about um, being stuck in your mind and not noticing what is going on, so maybe image A is not the best representation of mindfulness. Image B might be a good representation of mindfulness because we see the woman being aware of what is going on in her surrounding in the here and now, but she has also otherwise an empty mind. Nothing else is going on inside of her. Um, this doesn't really represent maybe our human experience so well because Mostly we have a lot of different things also going on in our mind that have nothing to do with the here and now. And so the third image shows the woman really being aware of all the different things going on around her, but also inside of her. And we could think that maybe this image is the best representation of something that mindfulness is about, being aware of what's going on around us, but also inside of us. So what is mindfulness? We can think of mindfulness also as a behavior of our mind, something that we can do. It is our ability to notice what is going on around us and within us, such as the world that we experience through our senses, like sounds, sights, smells, touch, temperature, and so on. And also the world that's going on inside us, our sensations, feelings, thoughts, urges, happening inside us. Let's do a test. Right now, notice where your body touches the chair or the floor and notice how it feels. Notice whether as you're sitting here, standing here or lying here, whether any of your muscles are tense or whether you are mostly relaxed in your body. Do you notice any tension in your body? Also now notice all the sounds going on around you. What do you hear? 
So which of these things were you not really aware of before we did this exercise? Chances are there are, might be many things that you actually haven't really been paying attention to or being aware of, but as soon as you um, gave your attention to it, you indeed were aware that these things are happening. So the thing is that often we do not notice all of the things that are going on around us or inside of us because first of all our attention is simply often limited. We can't really pay attention to everything most of the time. And importantly, our attention is often kind of hijacked or distracted by all the other things such as the other behaviors of our mind, such as the idea of our advisor, simply our thoughts and memories that kind of take us away from the here and now and our capacity for so-called mental time travel. So again, our ability to imagine or relive the past in our mind or imagine the future. So it is a good idea to practice mindfulness to bring us back into the moment and uh, expand our attention. Here are some elements of mindfulness that some scientists have included in, in definitions. So mindfulness includes um, self-regulation of attention to the present moment. So the idea of attending, paying attention to not what is going on or might be happening in the future, but the present moment here and now. It also often includes the idea of a non-judgmental openness to and acceptance of experience. So the idea that whatever we are experiencing in the present moment, we accept it, we are open to it. And sometimes some people also include as part of mindfulness the idea that um, it includes compassion or, or self-compassion. But again, as with many definitions, there isn't really one that all people or scientists might agree with. So this is just a loose list of how we might think of the different aspects that include that are included in mindfulness. Now, we can again ask, as with many behaviors, why do we have the ability for mindfulness? And as a re repetition, evolutionary anthropologists and behavioral scientists, they try to understand the causes of human behavior by asking why do we humans have the behaviors that we do? And our ability for mindfulness is an example of such a behavior whose causes we can also explore. As a reminder, we're using often the framework of Thunberg's questions to help us in mapping out these different causes of behaviors. So our ability to notice and sense is evolutionarily very old, depending on how one defines sensing and perception. If we really take a very basic definition, then even bacteria sense what is going on inside and outside them even if they are, of course, not aware of it, they don't have consciousness, but still they have mechanisms that allow them to experience or make sense of what is going on around them and react to it. And this is because this ability has an important function for survival in the world. The function of sensing perception is to detect the physical, psychological, and environmental stimuli in the immediate here and now, and then, if necessary, to be able to respond to them with behavior. And because of this important function, we are, as humans are also born with this ability to notice. As soon as we are born, or even before, we react to an, our environment. We get born, we sense it's cold, we start to cry. But this ability, of course, also develops further over our lifetime as we learn to notice more and more different things. And so we can also practice our ability to notice uh, throughout our lifetime and be start to become aware of more and more different things happening inside us and around us. Here's an interesting idea that also um, yeah, connects to an evolutionary understanding of mindfulness. Uh, the fact that animals most likely don't have the ability for language and symbolic thinking or the uh, ability for some vivid mental time travels um, makes this kind of an interesting exercise. They do have the ability to notice and be aware. So it can be fun to think about what would it be like to be an animal in a particular moment. 
and what could we learn from animals about mindfulness. Next time you see an animal, for example, your pet or an insect or an animal at the zoo, imagine what it be, would be like to be this animal in this moment, to simply exist, notice the world, patiently doing things or just lying around in the shade without any thoughts distracting you or telling you about problems in the world. A big question that we want to ask is what might be the role of mindfulness in sustainability? Why should we even pay attention to this concept? Think about how you would answer this question. So here are some of our ideas about how to maybe answer this question. Um, many or even most of our thoughts, judgments, urges and feelings are automatic and are, are still though influencing our behaviors often without our conscious control. We will explore more of these ideas, how our feelings, thoughts are often very automatic in the themes in this unit, such as emotions and feelings, the idea of fast and slow thinking, moral taste buds, and how language and symbolic thinking influences our mind to explore these rather automatic behaviors of our mind. Now, the problem is that these automatic, often unconscious processes, they may lead to inner and outer behaviors that are actually not moving us in a direction that we care about or that might be harming our well-being. And so through practicing mindfulness, we can learn to observe and become a little bit more aware of what is going on. It widens our attention and in this way, it allows us a wider space for choosing what to do and how to be in the next moment and to be in this way more in line with our values. So this is one way that we see the connection to sustainability and to human well-being that just it allows us to step back a moment from all the things that are happening and to be more aware and to choose more consciously. Now the thing with mindfulness is that it's kind of a little bit of a hype. Everybody now knows the term and there are people who then criticize this kind of um, development. So yeah, there is this growing self-help and happiness kind of hype, many self-help help books you find in the bookstore. And people are saying that with all this development, there is a little bit too much focus on the individual and on competition, meaning it's about how can I, as, as an individual, get more happy, more positive, more successful. If we look at this, then it's also often in relation to other people. How can I be more successful than others? How can I be more positive and so on? And what might get lost here is the role of community, of connecting with others, of doing good for human well-being. So many studies show that being part of a community, connecting with others, contributing to the community is in fact a very important uh, element that influences human well-being. And if we just focus on us as individuals, then this kind of important aspect might get lost. Here's an example of a book that was written about how mindfulness is basically just another way to um, perpetuate our individualistic thinking in our societies. So what can we do to address these criticisms? Several studies have looked at many different forms of mindfulness because there are in fact many different kinds of mindfulness and many different ways that we can practice mindfulness. And these different practices might have different effects on different kinds of outcomes that we might actually be interested in. One such project is the resource project at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig, Germany. And it looked at a, in a longitudinal way on the effects of three different mental training modules. One of them included exercises that are more about paying attention and practicing awareness, such as paying attention to our body. Another module focused on perspective taking, such as exercises like observing our thoughts. 
And the third module was the affect module, which focused on things like compassion and gratitude. For example, with the so-called loving kindness meditation. And the researchers were interested in how these different kinds of exercises affect certain outcomes, such as regarding our attention and awareness, acceptance and compassion. And they, through various surveys, they looked at really a lot of different outcome measures. So they measured these outcomes through survey items, such as regarding acceptance, um, in difficult situations, I can pause or acting with awareness. I am easily distracted. And so they found that the presence activities, which are all about practicing present moment awareness and attention, they were found to be not really sufficient to induce a broad range of changes across all the facets that they looked at, including compassion and self-compassion. And that things like acceptance, acting with awareness, non-judging, they also benefit, benefited from specific cultivation in the perspective or the affect modules. So perspective modules including things like paying attention and observing our thoughts and the affect module uh, including meditations or practices that allow us to focus on warm, loving feelings and compassion. And especially changes in compassion and self-compassion or the idea also of common humanity, having the feeling that our own experiences are simply part of what everybody goes through, part of the human condition. These outcomes were elicited almost exclusively by the affect module. So overall, it can sometimes be very important to not just practice some kind of attention-based mindfulness, but also different kinds of practices if we really want to um, see outcomes uh, across a broad range of important behavioral motivations. So one kind of uh, exercise that is more or less also was part of this project is the mindful listening exercise. As part of this module, you will do it with a partner, but if you don't have uh, a partner, you can also just try to do it in your everyday life. Uh, anytime you find yourself um, talking or listening to somebody, you can actually try to practice listening more mindfully, mindfully and compassionately to that person. The mindful listening exercise goes like this, that um, two, two partners are forming a pair and each one of you think about a story from your life that influenced you in some deeper way. For example, in your decision to become a teacher, if that is the focus of, um, if that is the group that you're a part of or any kind of other important decision or the kind of hobby you have and so on. So a story that is somehow meaningful and connects in a deeper way to who you are today and the decisions you made and that you are also willing to share. Then you will form pairs and in the first about three minutes, the first partner tells his or her story, uh, trying to take the full three minutes and the role of the other partner is simply to only listen with their full attention and to try to connect to and look for deeper emotions, values and purposes in this person's story and also points of empathy with the other person. Partner B who is listening might of course notice the urge of your mind to wander off or think about what you will say next and so on. And simply when you notice this happening, you return, you're paying attention to partner B, uh, partner A. Then after partner A is done telling their story, partner B takes two minutes to reflect back in as much detail as possible what kinds of values and emotions they have noticed in partner A's story. And then you switch roles. So this is an activity that connects mindful paying attention um, to what is going on but connects it to a more compassion emotional pro-social motivation based um, aspects mm -hmm.